Uh, well, first of all, thanks to Tom for inviting us along here. Thanks to everybody that's turned up uh, so far tonight. Uh, my name's John Holt, this is Simon Perry. I'll let Simon introduce himself properly later. Um, as Thomas said, I work for, for Scarecrow. I've been involved with the BTS for a number of years now. Uh, I'm also involved with the IET and in COSI, which is the International Council on Systems Engineering, where I'm the current technical director. And I've also got a chair at Cranfield University as well. I'm a visiting that. So that's, 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 that's the Dell boring background. Uh, now, before we, we get going, I thought I'd start with um, a peculiar story. And I don't come out particularly well in this towards the end of the story, but that's just one of these things. And because um, people often say, well, why did you first get interested in competency? What, you know, what happened? Because it's not really a natural area to get enthusiastic about. And about 15 years ago, um, I went to get a key cut at my local key cuttery uh, where I live. And uh, so I'd gone in, and I, I vaguely know the guy that works uh, behind the counter, because I've had keys cut before, and obviously engraved trophies and whatever else they sell there. So I went in with this key and said, can I have this key cut, please? Which he said, so he did his thing on the worthy machine with all the sparks, and he handed this key back to me. And so off, off I went back home. Now, I live about 100 yards from this shop, so I went back home, and the key didn't work. So I thought, well, that's not a problem. I'll, I'll take it back, and I'll get, um, I'll, I'll get it sorted. So I went back to the, uh, to the ironmongers, and uh, Chris wasn't there, but his dad was sat on the chair just behind the counter. So I said to his dad, uh, well, he said, can I help you? I said, yes, I've just got this key, and uh, it doesn't work. He said, well, give it to me, I'll sort it out. And so he fired up the big whirly machine with all the sparks, and he put this thing in, and he was there for ages. He was there for about two minutes. And he handed back this thing to me that was like the end of a key, the round bit, with like a needle on the end. And it completely worn down all the teeth on the key. And being the polite English person that I am, I said, thank you very much, I'll go and... I'll go and give that a go. Clearly, this was never going to open anything. So I went home and I dutifully put it in the door, and I said, of course, nothing happened. My wife said, What are you doing? And she said, It's ridiculous. Take it back. Go and so I go back to the shop again, and uh, by this time, his dad's gone, and, and Chris was there. I thought, This is going to be embarrassing. So Chris said, What can I do for you? I said, Well, I have this key. He said, Yes. 10 minutes ago, I said, Yeah. And uh, I gave it to him. I said, It doesn't work. He said, What have you done with it? I said, I haven't done anything with it. He said, I didn't do that. I said, no, what happened is I came back and your dad was there. And so um, I gave it to him and he sorted it out for me, but this is what it came out like. And he says, uh, my dad died five years ago. Ooh, tricky situation. And uh, so he said, well, who did this? I said, well, I came back. He said, well, no one's been in since you were here. So this is going to be creepy at this point. He said, uh, but what happened? He said, I, I did, after you went, he said, I did go out and pop out for five minutes and go to the loo. And when he came back in, there was a, an old guy there with a beard who had a key cut and then off he went. And what had happened is Chris had gone to the loo. This old guy, it wasn't his dad, it was just a bloke in who'd come in to have a key cut. I'd come in like the fool I am, assuming that he was the man that worked there. And he obviously fancied having to go on the worldly machine with the sparks and had a good old go, had me about this key, got his key cut and off he went. And so I realised then I've made this massive gross assumption that if somebody's in the right place at the right time, and particularly if they're, no offence, if they're old and they've got a grey beard, then... Yeah, yeah, well, I've got a curly moustache. They, they've got to be competent in some way. And, um, and it started me thinking, well, actually, how do you know who to trust and who not to trust? How can you have confidence? And I think this is a key thing, confidence, that the, the people that you come across are, are actually competent in the area that they're, they're selling themselves in. Um, and this really sort of started us looking at this. So this is the sort of start point for what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I'm going to start off for the first few minutes and just give us a general introduction. So the talk was called uh, Those That Can, which is the obvious, uh, you can fill in the rest yourself, uh, by myself and, and Simon. And there's a few areas we're going to cover. I'll give you a vague introduction and I'm going to talk about people generally. And then I'll hand over to Simon and he's going to talk about how we can understand things like competencies, how we can define them, um, and he's going to talk about some of the modelling techniques that we often use. And then we'll, we'll talk about some competency assessment issues at the end and then wrap up with some conclusions. Um, so we're going to talk about well, what is competency or competence? Are they the same thing or are they different? Because depending which book you read or even the, the same book or paper, they will use the terms interchangeably. So first of all, we have this sort of language, language issue. Exactly what do we mean by that? Um, you know, different people use the same terms for different things. The same people use different terms for the same things. Uh, why do we need it? Um, what do we mean by frameworks and how do we try and understand those things? Uh, how do we define these frameworks? Because we have some excellent off-the-shelf frameworks, but these things need to be tailored. And in many industries, you actually need to start them from scratch as well. You might need to reference a framework. But how on earth do we go about defining our own bespoke 
frameworks, and also how do we assess competence. And this is based on, uh, on sort of many years of experience and beating our head against the wall in many cases, uh, helping people with their competence. And obviously, much of what we're going to talk about today is based on uh, one of the books that we have published in the area, that's published by the BCS, which is how Tom first got in contact with us. Um, so if we take a step back now and we say, well, actually, I'm, I'm an engineer by trade, as is Simon. We're both what we call systems engineers. And when we engineer any sort of system or any sort of project, do you think, well, what's the key to success? What, what do you need to have in place? If you boil it down to its very essence, uh, there's three fundamental concepts that we need to understand in order to realise successful projects or systems. And it really comes down to people, processes and tools. Okay? So let's have, our first, oops, let's have our first diagram of the evening. Um, but very importantly, we, we've got these lines between them. Now when I talk about people, I'm talking about competent people there with the right skills for the role that they're playing. Okay? And that's very important when I come to the, the terminology we're going to be using later on. Um, by the process, we mean the approach that we're taking. Okay, so this would involve things like processes, uh, might be sort of maturity levels, these sorts of things, some of the standards and so on. And also um, tools. So these might be design tools, management tools, uh, whatever. You know, there might be things like um, techniques and notations that we might be using. But the key thing here is you need, to, you need to balance between these. And crucially, you need to make sure that your approach, I mean, you can have the best processes in the world. I guess most of us, a few people I was talking to earlier, said they were involved in project management and, and management of certain areas. And people go mad on process. And yeah, it's all about process and capability and all these kinds of things. You can have the best processes in the world. And if you don't have people who are competent to execute those processes, it's a waste of time. Okay, so this is one of the things that we've got to understand is we, we do need this balance. You can have the best tools in the world, and we see this all too often, uh, way too often, uh, but there's actually no process behind them. It's just people using these tools randomly. So we need to make sure that we do have an approach in place and that this drives the tools and not the other way around because countless times we've come across situations where people have adopted a, a specific tool set with no real knowledge on what they're doing and they end up just adopting the, the approach or the process of the tools that they're using. But very crucially, um, we have this thing here, which many organisations, in our experience, if you look at these three things, this is perhaps, I think, the, the area that most organisations that we deal with are, are the weakest in, is getting this right. And it's not just a matter of saying, right, we, we can put out a job description or, you know, we can look at CVs. We've got to make sure that these things are related together, okay, that these, these uh, the competencies that we think about for people are actually relevant to what we do and that are going to help us enable our business in some way. Because at the end of the day, uh, it all comes down to, you know, we need to deliver successful systems, we need to deliver successful projects, we need to stay in business, uh, we need to earn a living, and we need to make sure that we get these three things uh, right and we get the balance right. Okay. Um, so that's really just saying, so people, we mean people with the relevant competencies, processes need to be flexible and scalable and so on and applicable to different types of projects. And when I talk about tools, things like modelling, things like different frameworks, like uh, UK specs, beer, the encoding framework and so on, and things like modeling tools, assessment tools, whatever, whatever they're going to be. Um, so let's talk about people now. As I said, when I talk about people, we mean people with the right skills, but how do you know what skills people should have? Well, when we go about our everyday uh, lives and our everyday jobs, we take on different roles. And depending on what it is we're doing, we will play different roles. So in the day, I'm an engineer. In the evening, I'm a father, husband, and whatever. We do different things at different times based on the role that we're playing at that time. So very importantly, uh, we need to be able to identify what these roles or stakeholder roles are. You know, what is the role that I'm playing? Uh, what kind of things do I need to be able to do? What kind of activities am I carrying out? And therefore, what skills do I need to do that? Um, we need to define, for example, on a role basis, what we might call a competency scope. So what's the description of skills required for that, for that specific role? Okay, so that's what we mean by a competency scope. So one of the things we're trying to do here, and Simon's going to take it further later, it starts to use some sort of consistent language here. Um, as I said, when, we, when Simon starts looking at modelling, we'll see that. Uh, but how do we know um, how we do this? Because if we look at things like processes, there's loads of standards out there. Uh, there's ISO standards, there's British standards, there's European standards, there's all these different standards organisations. Many of these standards are process based. So when it comes to processes, we're almost spoiled for choice on which processes we should look at. Um, but when it comes to things like competencies, what do we look at there? 
And yes, we kind of do have standards, but typically they're, they're not defined as ISO standards as such or whatever, but we have what we call things, the things that we call competency frameworks. So we have a framework in place that identifies uh, a set of sort of skills with the knowledge and the attitude and so on that we need to demonstrate that we've got the right overall competence for a particular role. And these can be generic ones. So as I said, based, I use the term standards loosely there. So things like Sophia that we'll be mentioning later, uh, the, 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 the benchmark for all of these things are things like UK spec. Uh, the INCOSI that I mentioned earlier, they also have their own competency framework. But also you'll find in the individual organisations will require their own bespoke competency frameworks as well, maybe for their specific domain, maybe for the industry that they're working on. Um, and so it, it's not as clear cut as just taking one off the shelf and, and just sort of applying it. So I mentioned capability and I mentioned competence. What's the difference between them? Well, capability allows us to demonstrate the ability of an organisation or an organisational unit, you know, a small part of an organisation or, or a group or whatever. Typically, we'll audit these against standards or we might assess them against standards. So anyone that's ever undergone an ISO 9001 audit, for example, will be familiar with the uh, clipboard and quite rigid rules, pass-fail kind of approach. Also, if you've been involved with something like CMMI or uh, uh, 15504 or something like that, you'll be more aware of things like maturity assessment, which is a different kind of take on these things. Uh, you get different kind of outputs. Um, when we talk about competence, we demonstra we're demonstrating the ability of the individual. And the thing that we assess against there would be something like a competency framework, whether it's a, an off-the-shelf one based on the standard or whether it's a bespoke one that we might find within uh, a particular organisation. Um, why would we do this, though? What, what's the need? What's the driver behind the, this competence? Because it kind of makes sense, but well, there's got to be something in it for people. There's got to be benefit uh, for people. Whenever we do anything in, uh, in, in engineering or, or any area for that matter, we've got to make sure there's a benefit to doing it. We can't be applying these approaches blindly. So what would the benefits be? And we need to understand that different stakeholders, for example, different roles that you play, depending on who you are, you might take something different from something like competency assessment. So for example, uh, if, if you're looking to progress within a, a company, a specific organisation, you might do some sort of self-assessment on yourself to say, well actually, what are the skills that I need to get the next job? Uh, where am I now? What are the gaps? So you might use it as a, uh, a sort of self-help kind of thing. Uh, you might use it to assess teams. Do I have the right balance of skills within this team to achieve the capability that I'm looking at? Uh, so many things like career development. Um, you know, where's your career going? What skills might you need for different roles? Staff appraisals. We work with a number of companies now who actively use competency assessment as part of their annual appraisal system. And in fact, some organisations even go as far as to relate it directly to pay increases. So it becomes very important for the company then, but also if you work for that company, having a good handle on uh, how they're going to assess you each year can be very important for your career, but also financially. Okay? We then go down to the whole issue of continued professional development. So maybe going for chartership or some sort of accreditation, um, being a chartered IT professional or, or uh, engineer or a scientist, whatever it's going to be. So you might be looking at that. Actually, professional qualifications could be another reason. Um, Organisations are looking at this from the other side of the fence now, so that now when you put out a tender that you want people to bid on, some organisations now, rather than just asking for CVs, are putting out things like competency scopes and saying, can you send in competency assessments against this scope? We don't just want to know that they got a degree 20 years ago from this universe. How do we know what they've done in between? How do they know that they've been using this knowledge in some sort of useful way? And the bottom point there, uh, things like safety. Okay, it's very, very uh, important safety cases. Um, all the safety standards, any safety case work that you get involved in, makes this um, puts a requirement on the organisation to make sure that you have suitably qualified and experienced people. And not having people with the right competences can make you fail a safety case. Okay. This is becoming increasingly important. We were having a discussion before the talk about things like uh, autonomous vehicles. You know, as the systems that we're working on take on more responsibility and things like human lives are at risk, then we've got to make sure that the people behind these that are developing them actually have the right skills. We have the confidence in these people and their skills to develop, to develop safe systems. So there's all sorts of reasons why we might want to uh, assess somebody's competence and have a good idea of, of exactly what skills they've got and, and at what levels. So, and this two very broad camps of, uh, of assessment as well. There's what we call self-assessment that you typically do on yourself. 
and there's what we call third party assessment where you might get in a, 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 you know, an independent organisation to come in and assess your staff. They've both got their own pros and cons. Things like self-assessment is a lot quicker and a lot easier. You can say to people, this is the framework we're assessing against. You do need an approach in there though. You can't just give them this, the, the, the framework as we've seen on more than one occasion and ask people to assess themselves. Because what happens is people tend to come out fairly well on these things or certain classes of people tend to come out fairly well. Can we trust the result? And uh, lots of research has been done in the area of competence and it comes up with this consistent result that is people who aren't very competent think that they are. So if you give them self-assessment, they'll generally come up fairly high. People who are very, very competent tend to be fairly modest and will kind of almost mark themselves down. So you end up with not, not a massive differentiator between somebody who's fairly poor and thinks they're brilliant and somebody who's brilliant that's actually saying, well, you know, I get by, uh, or whatever. And I think everybody in the room has probably worked with somebody who uh, really thinks that they're, they're the most competent person in the world, but actually they're fairly rubbish. Okay? If you don't know somebody, if you never work with somebody like that, unfortunately it's probably you. Okay. <laughs> um, and we've got the reference to that paper as well, yes. as people want it. It's an interesting paper to read. Now on the other, as I said, we do have this rigorous approach. We need to make sure that even if people are doing the self-assessment, they're doing it in the same way, they're following the same approach, and because we, we need to both compare and contrast the results. Something like third party uh, assessment is very resource intensive. You need to get people in, it requires uh, you know, a minimum of two assessors usually. It can take hours, if not days sometimes. Um, you can only get a, a, you know, there's only a finite number that you can do in a, in a fixed period of time. But the results tend to be a lot more trustworthy. Okay. You've also got to ask yourself, um, how confident can you be in the people doing the assessments? Because you've now got this sort of chicken and egg thing where if you're being assessed by somebody, you want to make sure that they're competent to assess you because otherwise they might not give you a fair assessment. So there's all these sort of complex issues that start to come out, and again, it requires this rigorous approach. So when we talk about things like assessment, uh, we need something more than just somebody who's very good in the field. We also need somebody who's competent in carrying out assessments. Okay, so this is the sort of training that the BCS and the IET and the other professional bodies can offer people when they want to become accreditors or uh, assessors or, or, or whatever. Um, so there's all sorts of complex issues that lie around just the assessment itself. And I think the whole area of competency is a, a way more complex area than people tend to think it is. You know, it's a lot more than just looking at CVs. It's a lot more than just asking people to assess themselves. Um, so bearing in mind all, these, all this uh, complexity, how on earth do we go about trying to understand it and define competency and so on? So I'm going to uh, hand over to Simon now, and he's going to take over next to Thanks, John. Hello everybody, I'm Simon Perry. Uh, just a bit about my background before I uh, carry on. Um, I'm a mathematician by degree, and then a software engineer for many years, and then I, I, I worked at Bombardier in, in Derby for three or four years, and woke up one day and I was this thing called a systems engineer. I wasn't just concentrating on the software, any, software anymore, I was concentrating on the entirety of the system. And I've been doing that um, ever since for um, the last years now. Um, and as John said, sort of, Part of the approach that we take uh, and that we do as systems en engineers is we look at everything we do using modeling techniques. The same modeling techniques that were developed initially for modeling software, languages like the UML, which were then tailored for modeling more general systems, the systems modeling language. John and I use exactly those same techniques for any kind of problem that, that, that we're addressing uh, in our day-to-day -day job, and competency is no different. One of the key things, if you, you know, if you think about modeling, modeling is about helping you understand something. That something can be a piece of software, it can be a train, it can be a plane, an automobile. It can also be competencies and competency frameworks. So that's what I'm going to talk about a, a little bit here. As John said, Understanding, defining, and assessing um, competencies and, and competency frameworks is, is not easy to do. Um, the frameworks themselves are often quite complex, the concepts are complex. We need to catch that in a way that we can reason about it and, and compare one framework to another. And we need to be able to communicate those things. It's no good you know, understanding something if only one person on the planet understands it. Now, as engineers, one of the key things that we should be doing is making sure that people can understand what we're doing, otherwise we're failing as our jobs. We all work on socio-technical systems. Yeah. The days are gone where you can sit in a corner and hack away, sorry, do Agile or Scrum. That's 
a mini rant, sorry. <laughs> sorry to, um, yeah, but we, we can't work away in a corner now and, 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 and just throw stuff over the fence because the systems that we're working on are becoming increasingly more complex, used by people at increasingly different levels of skill. So we've got to be able to communicate what we're doing. Now, when it comes to competencies and frameworks, we can apply, as I've said, exactly those same modeling techniques to understanding competencies. So I'm not gonna make any apologies for the slides you're gonna see. You're actually gonna see some, well, SysML, it actually is. If anybody knows UML in the room, you'll understand the diagrams. And John and I do that um, whenever we come across a new competency framework that we're asked to, to work with, or whenever we come across a standard that we're asked to understand. It may be a standard that's nothing to do with software or, or systems. We can still apply these techniques. John and I, for our sins, play some rather strange board games involving zombies and invasions from outer space. And again, we do the same things there. A board game, the, the kind of games we play, complex set of components, complex set of rules, understand the interactions, you can apply exactly these techniques. So they're very, very powerful techniques. But the key thing with competency is it allows you to understand what the various frameworks out there are, are telling you. And it allows you easily, relatively easily, to develop your own bespoke frameworks. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So I'm not gonna go through all of these first few slides. So for example, this is a very high level part of our model of, of, of UK spec. I'm not, you know, it talks about competency being made up of uh, three types, knowledge, skill, and understanding, generic competencies, thresholds that you can hold things at, groupings of those competencies into various areas. This is probably 5% if that of our entire model, but this captures some of the top level ideas. Sophia, very, very different when you look at it, it's about a matrix with things held at different levels, holding different categories, completely different shape. The words are irrelevant, look at the patterns. That's what UK spec says about competency. That's what Sophia says. Don't matter what the words are. You go on to INCOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering, and you look at their framework for systems engineering. That's what their, the top level view of their framework looks like. So you've got three completely different competency frameworks there. And again, you know, we're looking at 5%, probably not, probably 1% of the models. But they're all to do with competency. One's from the sort of IT area, Sophia. The cozy ones from the more broad-based systems engineering um, domain, if you like. UK spec is the overarching one. We've got similar things for, for project management and proposal management. All of these different competency frameworks, they all have inside them the same kind of concept. But when you model them, they all look completely different. So how can you understand them? Well, by modeling, if you can model something, you can understand it. You can start to see where different frameworks use maybe different terms to represent the same concepts. You can start to abstract that information out um, and build up your own, we, we use a, a very grand term, your, your own ontology, your own framework, your own set of concepts and terms and how they're related. So they've all got, for example, they've all got the concept of a person uh, that holds one or more stakeholder roles, as John's already talked about. You know, we all take on um, many roles. I mean, even you know, in my day job as an engineer, the number of roles I take, engineer isn't really a role, it's a job title. You know, my role this evening is presenter. Um, you know, this morning I was communicating with a customer about an order, you know, I was very much in a sort of sales and marketing role. So we all take on these different roles. So it's wrong to think that, you know, in your day job, you, know, you have one role, you don't, you have lots and lots of different roles. Anytime somebody gives you a piece of code to review or a document to review, you're taking on a reviewer role. If you're sitting and interviewing somebody, you're taking on a reviewer role. So we have all of these different stakeholder roles associated with, with people. And the multiplicity works the other way as well. That, you know, a given role can be filled by many, many people. You know, it's not just one-to-one sort of -one mapping. Many people can, can be acting as reviewers in an organisation. So we can build up, carry on building up more concepts, so we've got the idea of person and roles. But then we've got the, the idea, as John um, introduced, this term here we call a competency scope. Okay? So that's about what 
competencies you require a particular stakeholder role to have. So any given role, the role of a reviewer or, a, or a, a somebody um, uh, um, project planning will have a scope associated with it. That scope describes the desired competence. Now this is where we use the word competency and competence. We use competence to mean um, uh, a sort of particular skill that you can define and you can say in this scope for this role you've got to have these skills if you will, these competencies. Com the problem is the plural of both words is the same, these competencies. Okay. Well that's great knowing what scope a particular role has got to have and what competencies you need to have in that scope. That's great. So what? So, as John has already mentioned, that becomes very, very powerful now when you're doing recruiting, when you're doing tenders, when you're proving the safety cases, because you can document these scopes. And in fact, John's going to finish off the presentation, he's going to talk about some scopes. You can capture these scopes as part of your, your, your model of the framework and your model of the, the competencies that your staff need. And you can assess against them. This is the primary thing that we assess against when we do competency assessments. It's a defined scope. And if you haven't got that scope, you can't assess somebody. Because how do you know what it is that they're supposed to be doing? And when you do an assessment, that's where we get the term a competency profile coming in. So the profile is the result. The profile is the result that describes the abilities of an actual human being, me, or, or Tom, or John, against a particular scope. And then the, and the, the profile describes the measured competencies, and a person exhibits that competence that's captured in that scope. But again, you know, John mentioned um, one of the problems with doing self-assessments. Um, you know, you say to somebody, okay, we're using Sophia, let's say, go and assess yourself against that. Well, which bits of it do you, against the whole framework? Or against a narrow part of it? Well, the key thing is, it should be assessed against a scope that's relevant to a particular role. And that's one of the mistakes that many organisations make um, when they do self-assessments. They will literally give people the framework and say, there you go, assess yourself against that. And people spend hours assessing against 40, 50 competencies that only five or six may be relevant to their key roles. So that's why this concept of scope is really important. And then, I'm not going to go, go through all of it, um, but I've added some more, more uh, onto there. Um, and when you look at that competence that the, that the scope um, describes, you can start to think about the level that it's held at. And these are the terms we use, awareness, support, expert, and lead. So you know, this is somebody, this is the sort of lowest level that you can hold, then you, you can hold at the support level, then the expert, uh, sorry, then the lead, and then the expert level. And that competence is made up of a number, the competence is made up of a number of competencies. So this might be um, project planning, architectural design, would be an example of a competence. That has a number of indicators, and we'll see examples of indicators in a moment. So the indicators are the actual measurable things. Must be able to describe what a Gantt chart is, would be uh, an example of an indicator. And they're often grouped in the various frameworks into competency areas. So think of a competency area as a ring binder on a shelf. Give me all the competencies on project management. Give me all the competencies on database design. It's just a, it's just a grouping for convenience. But the key thing, and John touched on this in, in something he said earlier, is this idea here of, that says evidence type. The evidence type defines um, the evidence that's admissible against a, an indicator. If you're performing a competency assessment and you say to somebody, okay, you know, it says here, explain you know, what a Gantt chart is. What evidence are you willing to accept for that? Are you willing to accept them saying, well, a Gantt chart is a way of doing project planning, it identifies the tasks and their relationships and blah, blah, and giving a verbal thing. Might be fine for that. But if that's a competency that you're assessing at the expert level, you probably want a little bit more, more than that. And the other thing with evidence is evidence has a time limit on it. If you get somebody for interview and go, oh, I see from your CV that you're an expert in object-oriented programming, and they go, yeah, 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 and you, which I used to be. You know, I used to do it for a living. I used to be a C++, C++ shows how old I am. 
with at least two more languages since then. You know, I'm an expert in C++ programming. And somebody said, well, when was the last time you did it? And I went, 15 years ago. Probably not as current as I should be. And, but that's the problem of the blunt tool that, that's the interview, if you like, when we look at the competence of people. We don't put any definition of the evidence type or the timeliness associated with that evidence. And there's nothing wrong to say, I used to do C++ 15 years ago, but because that's not my role anymore. Competencies go, like shares, competencies, the levels that you hold them, go up and down throughout your career. And if they're not, you're lying. Or you've had the same job for 30 years and you're still living with your mom. You know? Apologies to all the software engineers. Or <laughs> the drummers, or the banjo players. Um, but this is a key point here, and, and, and again, this is one thing, and, and it's actually one thing that most of the defined frameworks miss out. They're very poor and, uh, for uh, defining um, acceptable evidence times and the, and the timeliness associated with them. I was fortunate enough to work on um, the latest version of the INCOSI competencies framework, and even that, we never managed to get this in, in time for the final version. But it's a key thing. You've got to be able to say, these are the indicators, this is the kind of evidence that we'll, ex we'll accept. And we'll see examples of these coming up in, in the following slides. Now, we're going to talk about the levels now. And see, the, the, the slides you're going to see are actually um, extracts from, from a real competency framework. It's actually our own competency framework that we use in Scarecrow. Um, but just before I step on, Final couple of words about this. So, John and I arrived at this diagram by looking at things like Sophia, um, in Cozy Framework, UK Spec, the APM, the, the Association of, of, of Project Managers Frameworks, and a whole load of other frameworks. This is this is our abstraction of the key terms, and you can see this pattern here. It's very different to that, that, and that. Totally different pattern. But the underlying concepts are still there. And because those underlying concepts are still there, what that means you can do relatively easily is if you've got your own, if you've got that central ontology of, of concepts mapped and you model the other frameworks, you can start mapping one framework to another. The benefit that gives you is in defining your bespoke frameworks. Because if somebody comes along, you know, I said my background was IT. Increasingly, I found myself doing less IT, more general systems engineering, but also I was, do, I was running a team, so I was doing project management. Which competency framework do, do I get assessed against as the company use? Because if they use the Incosi one, it's great on the systems engineering, but not very good on the IT one. If they use Sophia, it's very good on the IT, but not very good on the systems engineering, and neither of them are very good on the project management one. And what we really want is a competency framework that combines the best parts of all of those source frameworks. And that's what you can do. And the, 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 our book that the, the BCS published, one of the key things, you know, this is like half of one chapter of, of the book, one of the key things in there is the book's got a whole technique and a whole process that allows you to model all of these source frameworks and then come up with your own bespoke framework that can actually pick the best bits. I want to use these concepts, these competencies from Sophia, these ones from Incosi, these ones from the APM, and we'll define our own framework. So then we can do competency scopes for roles that use those competencies. Why invent the competencies if they're already out there? We need to be able to pick and mix them. But this approach, this model-based approach, allows us to, to do that pick and mixing in a very controlled way that gives us consistency of approach and make sure everything fits together. So, for example, um, in our um, framework, we take a, a different approach. We have, for our level one um, awareness um, um, description, we have a description of what level one is, and then we have unique indicators for every competency. So, for example, modeling, project planning, architectural design, all that kind of thing. At level one, we'll have a whole set of indicators, and we'll see an example of one for modeling in, in a moment. But the key thing is the description. You know, you've got to be able to speak knowledgeably about it. Um, the main aim at level one awareness is that the, 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 the assessee, the person who's trying to demonstrate their competency, 
can show that they understand at a high level the concepts and they can back it up with some examples. Now, I'm not going to go through all of, all of these, but when we go on to level two, three, and four, we don't have a whole set of indicators defined for each competence. What we see is at level two, so that's your support level, you're not a newbie on the job, you've been doing it for some time, you can show um, that you can actually start to put into practice the ideas that you understand. Now, you come from college, you can probably talk and tell me what a Gantt chart is and, and what architectural design is and what a database is, but you've never actually really done, done it. This is where you've started to do it. So at our level two, you know, you've got to have achieved level one. You can't get level two competence if you're not level, competent at level one. And then we've got a whole set of indicators um, that they've got to have. Some training, for example. They've got to have created things related to the competency. You know, if the competency is in project planning at level two, they've got to have done some kind of project planning. But the indicators here are still generic. They're not specific to any particular competence. And we only do that at level one. And I won't go through the other two, but it's the same at level three. Here now you're looking at, you're not just done the work, you're leading people. You, 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 can, you can mentor people. You do this as your day job. If you know, somebody wants to know how to do it, they can come and ask you. You're leading teams, you're formally reviewing things, you've got experience facing clients, those kind of concepts. And then up to level four, this is you're an expert. You write books on it, you write papers on it, you speak at conferences, you know, you're the you're the person in the company that everybody phones up when they want to know about the subject. So we've got these four levels. Now John and I, we took this approach very, very deliberately because what a lot of the frameworks do is they define specific indicators at every single level. For example, Incozy does it. If you look, if you look at one of the Incozy competencies, it'll say level one you must be able to say what a Gantt chart is. I don't think that's actually the Incozy, but as an example. Um, you know, must be able to sketch out a Gantt chart. Level two, must be able to um, talk about um, uh, critical path. But the way some of these frameworks are defined, the levels above don't necessarily build on the levels below. And we actually assess some people against some of the frameworks when they could hit the level two and the level three indicators, but not the level one. So that means you're at lead level but you don't know some of the basic concepts and that's the problem with the way that some of the frameworks are defined so we've deliberately not taken that approach in, in the in the method that we advocate and then you've got uh, things like evidence times i haven't put the, the the timings on here just to keep the slide simple but you know down at level one where it's at the awareness level that's tacit knowledge that's somebody been able to, to to talk about it they've been on some kind of informal training course they you know they've read a book on it um, Level two, when they're shown that they're starting to do it as their day job, you know, they've got to have been on some kind of training, sort of like a degree course or something like that. They've got to be able to, you know, bring in documents and artifacts that they've produced, um, sit through a formal interview, and then again, you know, down to level three and level four, where we through, you know, level three, maybe you've got to have a master's degree or at least a, a, a first um, bachelor's degree. You've got to be leading a team. You've got to be reviewing stuff down to, you know, you've got professional qualifications, you're chartered, you, you, you're speaking, you, you're showing papers, you've written books, you've written. But again, let's say, with a lot of these, we would have timing that's associated with them as well. So here's an example, actually, of, of our, um, one of our competencies from our, from our own our Scarecrow competencies framework. This is a single competency to do with modelling. This is level one awareness. So these are the indicators. So to, when we assess somebody at level one against modelling, they've got to be able to show the kind of things that are listed here, and talk about them using tacit knowledge or proof of an informal training course. So that's what we mean by when we say way back here that the level one is unique for each competency. So for each competency in our framework at level one, we would produce a table like that, which would list specific indicators that somebody's got to be able to demonstrate. And then the level two, three, and four are just those tables you've already seen because they build on that. You've got to be able to show that, that you know you've done, you can do this at level three. You're doing it as your as your job. You're leading people, etc., etc.
Now, I'm going to hand over to John in a moment, but just before we do, um, so by taking this model-based approach, we're using a language on, on, on the screen there, a part of the language there, SysML. It was designed for developing systems, it's based on UML, as I said, but we're using it to model competency. There's no hardware or software there, we're using it to model completely abstract concepts. And it's such a, such a powerful technique. And as I said, by doing this concept of mapping, where you can model a standard or a competency framework, abstract out its concepts, and then map them to a central abstraction of that, you can then start to say, oh, these concepts in Sophia, these concepts in Incosi, these concepts in APM, these concepts in UK Spec, they're essentially all the same thing, but they use different names for them. And that becomes such a, such a powerful technique for, for not only doing competency frameworks, but for understanding things like uh, standards, John mentioned that, you know, we do a lot of work with standards, the same techniques apply for that. Um, so any time that you come across some kind of you know, problem in systems engineering, we turn to modeling and competency is no different. Um, in terms of the, the, the framework, um, it's all well and good at having it all modeled, but you've got to have process in place. And again, one thing that's, that's I don't want this to turn into a sales pitch for the book, but one thing that's in the book, we've actually got the whole approach, the whole process in there that we're just scratching the surface on here that tells you how to do the modelling, how to build up your bespoke framework, the kinds of artefacts that you have to produce to define a competency, a bespoke competency framework, and then the processes about how you go and carry out that competency assessment. Because as John said, carrying out competency assessment is not trivial. I mean, we did a, a, a big job for a branch of the MOD and we did about 60 people. And after we'd been doing it for a month, we got up to do what, about four people a day? But that was after. That, that was eight, eight, eight assessors. And that was eight assessors. It was two people doing each assessment. Um, when we started, we were barely getting through two people a day to do an assessment. And that's against one very focused scope that they were doing. It's very time consuming to do competency assessment properly. But if you get it right, it's a very, very powerful tool. Okay. Um, defining your, your bespoke comp, uh, competency framework, very, very useful thing to do. But again, you know, bear in mind, if you're gonna pick bits from Sophia, and you're gonna pick bits from Incosi, and you're gonna pick bits from APM, you don't necessarily have to model the whole competencies. You need to be looking at the competencies that are relevant to your org organization when you're defining your own bespoke competency framework. You don't need everything, and there'll be a lot of overlap. But there's a lot of good stuff out there. It's not about reinventing the wheel. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to John now for the final part. John's actually going to talk about a bit about doing the assessment and, and things like competency scopes and competency profiles. Okay, John. Um, so Simon showed us how the modelling works and how flexible that can be. And you know, the example we showed there, as Simon said, it's an example of one framework that we've used extensively. It doesn't have to look like that, and that's the purpose of the modeling, gives you this, yep. this flexibility. Um, so what, what do these scopes and profiles look like then? Well, again, they're gonna vary depending on the way that you do it, but we can show you uh, a couple of assessments of these. In order to do an assessment, what we need to know are what are the roles that we want to assess, what are the stakeholder roles? And for each one of those roles, what, what does the competency scope look like? What does the, uh, you know, like what's the shape of the competencies that we, we require? We need some sort of framework to base it on, whether that's standards based or whether that's a bespoke one that Simon's been talking about. We then perform the assessment and we produce what we call a competency profile. And again, notice I'm using all the terminology here now uh, with capital letters, because they're referring back to our ontology. We're using consistent terminology in everything that we do now, and that's another thing that the modeling gives us. So we might say, for example, these are the levels that we've got here, this is what a scope might look like, these are the various competencies that we've got, and these are the levels that we want somebody to hit in those. This is an example for quite a detailed bespoke one. If you look at um, one based on the standard, again, don't worry about the words on here, um, it might look a bit more like that. This is at a far higher level. Um, th these are for the same role as well, uh, interestingly enough. This is based on the ENCOSI model, this one is based on the, uh, on, on the bespoke framework. Um, why do they look so different? Well, these ones are a lot more specific. These ones are a lot more generic. Why might you want one rather than the other? Well, this one is good at a high level. It's also good if you want, if you want to change jobs, he says, to put it very crudely, because uh, this one will be recognized by all sorts of big companies because it's a standard. Okay. 
This one, sorry, spoiled the ending there. Um, this one is a lot more detailed and it's a lot more specific because it's bespoke, it's geared towards a particular organisation. So from the organisation's point of view, this is probably more effective. It might be if you're looking to move on or you're looking for something like CPD and going for charter status, that something like this might be more effective. As Simon said, if you do the modelling uh, correctly and appropriately, uh, you can actually do something like this and actually produce something like this at the same time because the mapping from the bespoke framework to the standard frameworks has already been done. Okay, so it's not an either or in many cases. We, we can derive one from the other. Uh, let's look what uh, the output might look like. This is what is we that want. the requirements engineer? I think that's the requirements yeah. engineer example, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the, the key thing is that the, these are scopes for a specific role. Yeah. yeah, they're not for one specific role that you may be taking on in your job. These are requirements. For people watching this on video, that's Simon Perry's voice. We'll just it. Um, so what we've got here, if you look at the shape on here, this is the same shape that we've just seen. Okay. However, what we're doing now for each one of these boxes, we're actually saying whether we've met that or not. Okay. What we do, we look at the indicators and we perform a, you know, a, a bit of maths on it, we do a little bit of statistics, and rather than just saying pass or fail, we have four levels. You could either be not met, which means it's, I think it's 5% or below, of the indicators you've met. Uh, you can be partially met, which is approximately between 5 and about 35, I think. Uh, you can be largely met, which is kind of 35 to about uh, 75, and you can be fully met. We can say, well, actually, if you've met 75% plus of the indicators, we will say that you've fully met that. Okay. So rather than just giving this uh, yes, no, yes, no, pass or fail on each level, uh, we give it the, these four levels of grading. And basically, we borrowed that from, if anyone's ever done CMMI or any of the process assessment things, uh, we borrowed that technique from there as we have with some of these uh, assessment techniques. And Simon mentioned the process. The process that we advocate is again, um, it's based on process standards, on different assessment types of standards as well. It's got a full pedigree, it's got a, a, you know, a, a logic behind it. Uh, so that's just a quick example of what some of these things might look like. Um, to, to wrap up the, uh, the presentation as a whole then, Competence is, is essential for realising successful projects and successful systems. We spoke about people, process and tools, and in my experience, it's, it's out of those three com people, the competence is the area that is more often than not missed out, either uh, glossed over or in many cases completely uh, missed out altogether. It's non-trivial, it's complex, it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to communicate with people. Uh, so how can we cope with this? One way that you can do it, and we're not saying it's the only way uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but the way that we've uh, been using over the last sort of 10 or 15 years that we know works time and time again is to apply things like modeling techniques. Okay? The notations we're talking about, as Simon said, originated in the software world, moved on to the systems world. In a way, it's irrelevant what notation you use. We're not saying use UML systems. <laughs> they work for us. Uh, but if you did want to use UML system for this, and you had more money in the sense, you could buy all nine of our books. Uh, you get a free shrine you buy all nine of them, which is a and a personal visit and a personal <laughs> a personal service. Um, but that that really concludes everything that I I, I want to say. Um, I think on behalf of myself and Simon, we'd like to thank the VCS. We'd like to thank Tom for inviting us. We'd like to thank everybody for coming.